Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Sri Nagarajan. Uh, Sri is a, a full professor at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF, in biomedical imaging. He obtained his PhD in biomedical engineering from Case Western Reserve University and did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Keck Center for Integrative Neuroscience at UCSF. He has been the director of the UCSF Biomagnetic Imaging Laboratory and involved in multimodal brain imaging. He has also been involved in several basic and clinical neuroscience studies applying multimodal imaging technologies with applications to the study of speech motor control and imaging hum human brain plasticity. He is a fellow of the IEEE and a recipient of the Mid-Career Award from the International Society of Biomagnetism. Shri has been a principal investigator on the SCAP and FCAP studies in Simon's VAP and has been involved in multimodal structural and functioning imaging in subjects with 16P11.2 deletions and duplications. He has also been interested in speech and motor control issues in 16P11.2 deletions and duplication CNV cohorts. And in this webinar, he will present results from that data that his team members collected during a 16P11.2 family meeting. Great. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, can I go ahead with the presentation? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited to share uh, the findings of our study, uh, uh, which was just recently published in Nature Scientific Reports. Uh, for those interested, you could uh, look at the uh, 2018. Uh, this is the title of the study. Uh, it's called Abnormal Speech Motor Control in Individuals with 16P. 11.2 deletions. Uh, the first authors of the study are Carly Demopoulos and Harik Kotare. Carly is a postdoc in our group and uh, Harik is a graduate student in our group, as well as several other team members, uh, Danielle, who was involved in data collection, uh, and uh, the main uh, PIs in the study are uh, John Hood, Elliot Scher, and myself, Sri Nagarajan. Um, so we were, uh, in this study, we were very interested in uh, examining speech motor control in uh, 16P11.2 deletion uh, subjects. And the reason we were interested in looking at speech motor control is because of uh, several recent studies that show that uh, 16P11.2 deletion carriers show abnormal coordination deficits as well as speech and language deficits uh, most recently, uh, in a study uh, of 55 individuals with deletion carriers, uh, it was shown that many of them have uh, higher than expected incidence of childhood apraxia of speech, which is a classic speech uh, coordination and speech production deficit. So we were interested in trying to understand what are the perhaps the fundamental mechanisms that contribute to these symptoms that are manifested as coordination or speech coordination disorders in 16P11.2 deletion carriers. So in thinking about speech coordination, we want to ask questions about how do we control the way we speak? And that's what I'm going to sort of focus uh, today's webinar on. And the way we think about speech motor control, you could say, how do we control anything? Uh, in particular, speech is the acoustic signal that arises because of the way we control our articulators. And there are several parts in our vocal apparatus, which is the throat, the larynx, as well as the jaw and the tongue and the lips, and several other muscles, including respiratory muscles, that we have to coordinate to produce intelligible speech. So when one thinks about uh, the problem of how do we control uh, speech, uh, there are two fundamental modes of control of the way we speak. Uh, one is uh, perhaps very intuitive to people is called feedback control, which is we use feedback that we uh, generate when we speak. And there are two forms of feedback that arise when we speak. One is auditory feedback or acoustic feedback that we hear ourselves speaking. And the second is called as proprioceptive or somatosensory feedback, which is our ability to feel where our parts of our mouth are. So we can feel whether our lips are close together or apart, if our jaw is close clenched 
or it's ah, uh, it's really lower. So we can kind of have this sensation of somatosensory sensation of our jaw and our vocal apparatus, our tongue, as well as uh, our uh, acoustics of what we hear ourselves when we speak. So using this sensory feedback to control speech is called feedback control. Um, this is one mode of speech. We know that we use feedback in the control of speech uh, by experiments in the laboratory setting where we can show that when we change feedback, we change the way we produce speech. So in, in uh, healthy subjects, normally uh, the best demonstration of this is when you have delayed feedback. So if you're in a very reverberant environment, like say you're in a cave where you have lots of echoes, it's very hard to speak clearly and intelligibly uh, in that environment. It's because the delay really messes up the way we speak. So uh, that is perhaps the evidence that if the feedback is not correct, which is delayed or some other form of feedback, then we actually have difficulties in speaking. So how do we use feedback in the control of speech is an open question. And one task which I will describe in, in just a bit that we can use to study this is called the pitch perturbation task. I will get to a little details about that in, in a minute. But before that, I wanted to talk about a second way we use uh, to control speech. basically saying that we can actually grow speech even when we do not have feedback. And the perfect example is most of us can speak even when we cannot hear ourselves. So if I have a very loud environment, uh, like say noise in, in the environment, I can still speak. If I shut out my ears, I can still speak perfectly intelligibly. So it's not clear that you need feedback to speak. You can use you can produce speech or you can control your speech without feedback. And this form of feedback of controlling speech is called feed forward control. During normal speech, speakers use both feedback and feed forward processes. So it seems interesting to ask the question in 16p deletion carriers, when they have speech deficits, speech production deficits, which mode of control is impacted in these individuals? Is it feedback control or is it feed forward control? And how is the impact? Is it an impairment or is it an enhancement in that mode of control? Those are the kinds of questions where we were interested in posing during the family meeting. So the first question we wanted to ask is, how is feedback control impacted in probands? And the way we do this is using this task I referred to earlier called a pitch perturbation task. That is shown in this figure, uh, is a speaker. We usually took uh, patients or uh, subjects and we had them wear headphones and uh, with attached microphones. The signal coming out of the microphone is shown in blue and the signal going into their headphones is shown in red here. What we have in the laboratory is the ability to change the signal coming out of the microphone we can modify it using digital signal processing and modify what it is that you hear when you speak. This is something that we can do in real time in the laboratory. And what we did for this task is have subjects do something called as a very simple task, it's called phonation, which is just have subjects go, ah. What they do is they hold their pitch constant. So the pitch is the frequency that we generate by vibrating our vocal folds, which is the larynx. And so, we have subjects just come in and just go a simple phonation task where we ask them to hold their pitch. Ah, uh, it's a constant pitch. But experimentally, what we do is we manipulate the feedback so that what subjects hear is not what they produce. What, they, what we ask them to produce is ah, uh, hold them, constant. But occasionally, what they hear is something like this. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, where we raise their pitch. Actually, in some trials, we would raise their pitch, so they would hear, ah, uh, ah, uh, or in other trials, we would lower that pitch, so they would go, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And this is an experimental manipulation in terms of what they hear. What we ask them to produce is just, ah, uh, constant. 
But what they actually end up doing is they do not just produce a constant pitch. They actually try to oppose whatever direction we shift the feedback. So if we raise the pitch such that what they hear is, ah, ah, what they actually do is go, ah. So they oppose the pitch to oppose the applied pitch shift that we impose experimentally. So what we do is we have subjects come in and do this task and we have trials where they either lower their pitch or raise their pitch. And then we look for the compensatory response, which is the brain basically compensating for this externally applied control in their uh, applied shift in their feedback. So this compensation is a evidence for feedback control. And what you see here, I'm gonna focus on, is time on the x-axis, and the pitch changes are shown on the y-axis, and the curve here shown in the dashed line, I hope you can see my cursor, this is what healthy controls would do. They raise their pitch, what is shown here is the compensation, which is really how much they oppose the applied shift. So this curve here is pooling together pitch increases as well as pitch decreases. And what we plot is the compensatory response by healthy subjects as well as proband carriers. And what we show is that uh, subjects do compensate, which is their feedback control. And what we find in 16P deletion carriers shown in this dark black curve with error bars shown in the light black curves here, it shows is that they appear to show an elevated compared to controls or enhanced feedback control response. So feedback control is not impaired in 16P deletion carriers. Rather, it is enhanced. 16P deletion carriers appear to be more sensitive or more reliant on feedback control compared to healthy controls. What about feed forward control? So the way we can look at feed forward control is the fact that why uh, is to think about how, do, how it is that we use, uh, uh, how, do we, how, do, how do we do feed forward control? Well, the way we do it is because our brain knows what sounds it will produce even if you can't hear yourself. That is why we can speak without feedback. So this knowledge in the brain is something we can ask, uh, how intact is this knowledge? And the way we know that the brain knows is because our vocal apparatus is changing all the time. Like for instance, when we grow, our vocal, uh, for, uh, vocal tract grows, but our voice and our speech remains intelligible throughout development. So we know that our brain needs to know what the size of our vocal tract is over, over time as it develops. But also we know that occasionally we might have, let's say, uh, some, uh, something, some impact. Let's say we're, we have a sore throat and our throat is not functioning as well. Or uh, let's say we've chewed too much gum and we feel like fatigue in our jaw. Or we went to a dentist and we got some dental work and our, our oral cavity doesn't feel the same. Those impacts, those, those interventions in our vocal apparatus do not impact the way we speak intelligibly. We're still able to speak intelligibly, maybe a little slightly different, maybe a little slurred. Let's say if you're coming back from our dentist, you might feel that it's a little, your lips are swollen and your speech is a little slurred, but it's still very intelligible. So the reason it's intelligible, even though we've changed the way our vocal apparatus is, is because our brain knows how to speak and it needs to, it knows what, commands to give to our vocal apparatus to produce intelligible speech. So we can ask, how, how is this knowledge represented? And one way we can also study is how intact is this acquisition of this knowledge? This knowledge is learned, first of all. So how is this learning? So one way we can do to evaluate, we can, in the laboratory, we can evaluate how good is the learning of this knowledge of how the brain produces sounds or sense commands to produce intelligible speech. And this is, uh, this is what we call uh, feed forward control. And one way we can study this in a laboratory is called using something called this adaptation. So uh, I will explain what this adaptation is, uh, but before I, 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 I say what adaptation is, we particularly in this task, what we vary is something called as formants. 
And uh, format is just a jargon for the uh, frequencies that are used to identify vowel sounds. So different vowels in our speech, like a, ah, e, u, e, are all different vowels. They have distinct frequencies that distinguish them. And those distinct frequencies are called formats. And in a laboratory setting, we can vary the formants or the vowels that subjects hear, which is different from what they said. So here, we have the same experimental setup. We have subjects wearing a earphone with a microphone. And we ask subjects to say vowel sounds. In this particular case, we ask subjects to say the word bed. And the vowel here is a. Eh. And what we do is you can see the signal, blue signal goes into our real-time digital signal processor. And we modify it so that what they hear on their headphones is the word bad, which is the vowel sound a eh, has changed to the vowel sound a. Ah. And we ask, what do subjects do in trials where we give them bad and they hear bad? If they have knowledge about what, uh, what they should produce, the fact that there's a discrepancy between what they said and what they heard should drive them to produce different sounds. And indeed, they do that. Over time, if you alter bad repeatedly to the vowel bad, they will end up saying something like, bit. Okay, so they will change their vowel production to counter the effect of repeated consistent alteration in feedback. So this assessment of feed forward control is uh, basically, this task is called an adaptation task where we ask how do subjects adapt to consistent and persistent feedback that is imposed across trials. So the way we can look at this is uh, by looking at what changes do they do to their feedback when you consistently alter their feedback in their vowel production? So what, we're sh what I'm showing you here is data from deletion carriers in blue and uh, in, from controls in red. And the x-axis here is time for trials, okay? So it's just trial one through about 20, where they're just producing what we call baseline trials, where here they, they produce the vowel bed or the word bed with the vowel eh, and they hear eh, okay? There's no alteration. So you can see that the vowels are, uh, the, the groups are fairly uh, similar in their production of the vowel. And at trial 20, we alter, we have on altered feedback. And here we alter the vowel eh to ah, and we ask how do the both groups of subjects shift it to counter this alteration. And so they shift add to E. And you can see that the control subjects shift about, um, in this case, it's 20% towards the, uh, to counter the applied alteration. Whereas the probands, 16 feet deletion carriers, shift about eight to 10%. So about half of the shift is, is smaller in the deletion carriers compared to controls. So in contrast to, so I'm just gonna, the next slide, I'm just showing you the quantification. Uh, here is the uh, baseline uh, performance in both the controls and the deletion carriers, which is very similar in the baseline unaltered feedback. And when you alter it, you can see here, the controls adapt about 20% and the uh, probands adapt about 6%. And it's highly statistically significant, even for this small uh, sample that we collected this data on. So just to summarize, the probands show enhanced feedback control, but diminished feed forward control. It allows us to, to think about what are the implications of this result. What we think is that because of their diminished feedback, feed forward control, or, which is an impairment, you would say, because they perform less than controls, they actually shift the balance in terms of how, as I said earlier, Controls and normal speakers use both feedback and feed forward control to control their speech. This data suggests that the probands appear to use uh, more of feedback because their feed forward system appears to be uh, Im impacted. So the next steps we wanna do are to do brain imaging while subjects do these tasks. So uh, in our laboratory, we have uh, scanners that we can look at functioning brain activity. 
uh, we use a technology called magnetoencephalography or MEG, which is basically detecting the magnetic fields that our brain generates. And we have a setup to where we can take input from a microphone while subjects speak and change it through using our digital uh, signal processor and feed uh, back signals that are, necess that are different from what they speak. So they hear differently from what they speak, which is similar to what we did in our uh, family meeting studies. Now we can do it while subjects are in a brain imaging scanner. So it allows us to look at the brain and ask which parts of the brain contribute to this shift in balance to more feedback control because the feed forward control system appears to be impacted in 16p11.2 deletion carriers. So this is what we would like to find out in our next set of studies. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the many um, uh, people who contributed to this work, uh, which was led by Carly Demopoulos, our postdoc in our group, and Hare Kotare, our graduate student, as well as my co-PIs, John Hood and Elliot Scher. Uh, thank you.